Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Chapter 10 of Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan has a rather curious title of power, worth, dignity, honor, and worthiness. And if you look at the, the chapter itself, you notice that he gives a lot of scope to discussing what honor actually consists in. And you can ask yourself, well, why is this all put together here? And the answer to that is, you know, remember that Thomas Hobbes is trying to provide a new philosophy, which is supposed to clarify everything that needs to be clarified, particularly about social and political life and the terminology or language or concepts that we use for making sense out of things. So this is part of his larger framework and system. And he's going to define each of these important terms in ways that are reflective of other authors, but also are really distinct to his own approach. And we have five main terms here, right? We have power, which is the first thing that he discusses, and we'll, we'll go into that a bit. Uh, value or worth, this is directly tied to power, but it introduces another concept. Um, honor, which is connected with value or worth, but also brings in yet another concept. Dignity, which is similar to honor, but in a somewhat different twist. And then finally, at the very end of the chapter, he brings in worthiness, almost as an afterthought, and says, well, it's not this, it's not this, it's actually this. So let's look at each of these in turn. And then we'll look at some of them in a little bit more detail and talk about how they, how they come together. So power is what he begins with. And he tells us that the power of a person to take it universally is a person's present means to obtain some future apparent good. Now that's rather abstract, but if you think it through, it's not that hard to, to fathom, right? What does it mean? So the, the means, the, the ability, the, uh, things that, that this person can put on the table that will allow them to attain something that appears to be a good. It could be a real good, or it can just be something that's apparent as a good for them. And as we're going to notice, power is something that can be transferred or, or shared or harnessed. So my ability to do, to attain some present good, for, for example, in explaining Thomas Hobbes to you, if that's a, a good, if you're listening to my explanation and it's sparking the right thoughts in your head, then, you know, my power is something that is beneficial to you, right? It can also be beneficial to me because I like talking about Thomas Hobbes and unpacking concepts. And he makes a distinction be be between natural power, the eminence of the faculties of body or mind, right? These will come to instrumental or powers which are acquired by these and fortune. So we'll, we'll, we'll look at those in just a moment. Then we have value or worth. And this is quite interesting. Hobbes says the value or worth of a person is the price that somebody would have to pay or that would be given for the use of that person's power. So this is a, a rather different way of talking about value, right? If I say, well, you know, I value my, my wife, I value my friend, I value my children, Hobbes would, you know, come along and say, well, that's very nice, but I don't mean value in that same sense. 
what would you pay? What, what would you give for the use of their power? You know, and in the, in the case of children, you say, well, what am I actually, what do I need from them? You know, love and affection, I guess. Honoring, as we're going to talk about in just a moment. Uh, carrying on my family name or something like that. They don't actually have that much to offer from a Hobbesian perspective. Uh, and you can read, you know, about that later on in, in uh, one of the later chapters where he talks about the children and the family. Um, this really puts things in a very different perspective, doesn't it? So the value of a person is what they can give us. What, what we're willing to give to them it, it, it could be money, it could be time, it could be honoring, it could be pick whatever you want. Uh, what are we willing to give to them so that we can get from them what we want, the good, the apparent good, or ward off some evils? So he says that if this is not absolute. This is a thing dependent upon the need and judgment of another, and we'll come back to that in just a moment. Then we have honor. This is a topic that Hobbes gives a lot of examples for and talks about quite a bit. And honor is tied to this conception of value or worth. He calls it a manifestation. When we honor somebody, we manifest what we value them as. And, and you know, this is at a high rate because if, he says to value a person at a high rate is to honor them. At a low rate is to dishonor them. And high and low is to be understood by comparison to the rate that each person sets on themselves. So if I think that, you know, everybody should get up when I walk into a room or shut up when I'm talking or what else? We could come up with all sorts of other funny examples like that. If I do something good, you should send me a thank you card. Right? I'm setting that rate on myself. You might not actually follow that. You might be like, hey, I, I already did enough. You know, um, Dignity is related to honor, but dignity comes about not from individual agents, you could say, but he, it's what he calls the public worth of a person the value set upon them by the commonwealth. This is what people call dignity. And this value of this person by the commonwealth is understood by offices of command, judicature, public employment, or by names and titles introduced for distinction of such value. So there's, there's a sort of, you know, private, although it's not entirely private, it happens in public and value of honoring, right? It's actually very public. And then there's dignity where it's the community that is honoring a person or dishonoring them. You could have, you could lack dignity, right? Then we have at the very end, worthiness. So let's look at that. He says, worthiness is a thing different from the worth or value of a person. It's also from their merit or desert, what it is that they, they deserve and consists in a particular power or ability for that whereof he is said to be worthy, which particular ability is usually named fitness or aptitude. And he says for, for the person who's worthiest to be a commander, to be a judge or have any other charge is the best fitted with the qualities required to the best discharging of it and worthiest of riches, kind of an interesting example, is the one who has the qualities most requisite for the well using of them. So we can be worthy of all sorts of things and that doesn't tie in directly to our value. This is a very interesting point. We can um, deserve things and that doesn't tie in necessarily to, to our worthiness. If, if things are arranged you know, in the best, most rational way, the people who do in fact have, you know, the greatest fitness or aptitude for something get to do that thing uh, or get tapped to do that thing. They get asked to do that thing. That's very often not the case, right? We live in a society where things are often much more arbitrary and fit in with these other conceptions, which may or may not be on, on point. So let's talk about uh, a few other uh, concerns with these. Let's let's jump back to value or worth 
uh, from worthiness. So, right, he says it's the what would be given for the use of this person's power. It's not absolute, a thing dependent on the need and judgment of another. So it's not something that you can say stays the same in all cases. He gives the example of an able conductor of soldiers is of great price, great worth in a time of war, but in peace, not so. They get disvalued in that case. A learned and uncorrupt judge is worth much in a time of peace, but not in a time of war. And then he says, as in other things, so in men, not the seller, but the buyer determines the price. For let a man, as most people do, rate themselves at the highest value they can. Their true value is no more than it is esteemed by others. So I can, you know, Set, I can think that I'm the, the greatest guy ever, but unless you or somebody else agrees with my assessment, that's not really my value. I can be misled by myself about what my value actually is. And I probably need to figure out what it is by testing out, you know, what would you pay for my, my services? What would you give for my goodwill or whatever it's going to be? So that's kind of interesting. Let's jump back to, to power as well. He gives a lot of examples of power. Remember, power is the uh, means to obtain some future apparent good. So natural power, right? We come back to that body and mind, strength, form, prudence, arts, eloquence, liberality, nobility. Instrumental are those powers which acquired by these or by fortune are means and instruments to acquire more. What are the examples of these? Riches, reputation, friends, the secret working of God, right? Uh, which men call good luck. So we have on the one hand, the, you know, faculties of body and mind. And on the other hand, we have all these other things that we typically call like external goods, like, you know, um, fortune or uh, wealth or good friends or things like that. And then he goes on and he says, the greatest of human powers is that which is compounded of the powers of most men united by consent in one person, natural or civil, that has the use of their powers depending on their will. This is the power of the commonwealth. This is what he's going to call the power of the sovereign or the magistrates, the stand-ins for the sovereign. But we could think, you know, also about the harnessing of the power of so many other people by the CEO or the board of a corporation, right? Or, um, you know, even with, with uh, illegal associations, the person who's in charge is harnessing the power of others. We could think of this in terms of social media followings and being able to get people to do things. You know, if you can monetize your content be, by creating your own website and having people flock to it because you have celebrity, that's power in Hobbesian terms. And it's coming from what other people are doing. And so he gives a lot of examples. Riches joined to liberality as power. Why? Because it procures friends and servants. Reputation of power is power because it draws with it the adherence of those who need protection. Um, we'll take a few other examples. Whatever quality maketh, make a person beloved or feared of many or the reputation of such quality is power. It's a means to have assistance and service of many. So a lot of times power isn't something, you know, real in and of itself. It exists in our own views on things. Good success is power. It makes reputation of wisdom or good fortune. Very interesting. We often think that people who are successful are intelligent when quite often they were just lucky, right? Hobbes uh, observes this in his own time. Eloquence is power. Nobility is power. Reputation of prudence is power. Form is power, right? The sciences, he says, are small power because not eminent and therefore not acknowledged in any, in any person, nor uh, are at all, but in a few and in, in them a few things. Um, arts of public use, however, are very much power, like making of uh, engines and other instruments of war, right? Um, and so, you know, these are all examples of the ways in which we could have exercise and be assigned power. What about honor? This is Hobbes talks about it at much greater length, right? Manifestation of valuing. We don't need to look at every single example that he provides because he spends page after page discussing it, but we can get the general idea. He says that, um, here we go. To obey another person is to honor, 
right? Because nobody obeys them who they think have no power to help or hurt them. Consequently, to disobey is to dishonor. And we see these polarities, uh, these oppositions back and forth. To give great gifts to a person is to honor them because it's buying protection and acknowledging of pleasure. To give little gifts is to dishonor. Um, to give way to or place to another is to honor them. To arrogate is to dishonor. To show any sign of love or fear of another is to honor them. For both to love and fear is to value. To contemn, right? To not care at all or less to love or fear than he expects is to dishonor. Why? Because this is undervaluing a person. And he goes on with a lot of examples like that. Um, He says, to do those things to another which he takes for signs of honor or which the law or custom makes so is to honor. So we can honor a person by doing the stereotypical actions that are already acknowledged as honoring or perhaps idiosyncratically in the case of that person. Like, you know, if buying a person fountain pens, they say, oh, this is to honor me. And you go and you're like, hey, man, here's 10 fa- fountain pens. I, I really like you. You're, you're honoring them. Whereas if you went to somebody who despises fountain pens and did that, it would, it would be a dishonoring, right? He says, to honor those another honors is to honor them as a sign of approbation of their judgment. To honor his enemies, on the other hand, is to dishonor that person. And so, you know, we see example after example of this. And honor can be quite uh, complex. He also talks about what is considered honorable in general. Um, but there is one remark that, that he comes to later on. He says, It doesn't alter the case of honor, whether an action, be it so great and difficult and consequently a sign of much power, be just or unjust, right or wrong. For honor consisteth only in the reputation of power. It's not about doing the right thing or doing the wrong thing. This is very different than a lot of other moral theories. So he said, you know, for example, the ancient heathen did not think they dishonored, but greatly honored their God when they introduced them in their poems, committing rapes, thefts, and often great, but unclean or unjust acts, right? Um, and so, you know, he, he's got examples of this. Uh, amongst men, till there were con- constituted great commonwealths, it was thought no dishonor to be a pirate or highway thief, but rather a lawful trade, not only among the Greeks, but um, among all the other nations. So, you know, this is, this is another important point. And then he, he goes into a lot of other discussion about that, but you can, you can check that out yourself, these, these examples that are, you know, fairly minute. The general point is, These are all concepts that we need to take into account if we want to understand how human beings, how they relate to each other, how they, how they understand each other, why they come into conflict or why they might be inclined to avoid conflict with each other, which is a really central feature of this, this work Leviathan.